I will be fairly brief today because I think our upcoming show really warrants our full attention. But there were three items that I thought I should address just for general information. Uh, three announcements, really. Uh, two of them relate to events in early April. Uh, on April the 6th at 12.30, the Faculty Women's Club is holding an event to raise money for their child care bursary. The bursary is for assisting students who have young children and who need help with childcare to continue their studies. <coughs> the event features the famous UBC cinnamon bun, and it is a cooking instruction class. Uh, the chef or baker of the buns, I guess, is Andy Chan from UBC Food Services, and he will both provide a recipe and offer instructions on Zoom about how to make UBC cinnamon buns. Uh, there is a, a side element to this performance, which involves an invitation to those who register for the event. <coughs> Excuse me. Who, those who register for the event to write a haiku or a small poem uh, about the cinnamon bun, the UBC variety, of course, and that poetry competition will be judged and a prize will be awarded for the best poem or haiku. Uh, that will be done by Wendy Yip, uh, the president's wife. And then uh, the star turn of the uh, show, I suppose, beyond the baker, will be an official tasting of UBC's cinnamon buns, uh, which suggests there might be some variety in the recipes. Uh, and the tasting will be done by none other than our president. I guess there have to be some perks to being president of the University of British Columbia. And one of these is tasting the cinnamon buns at this competition. So Santa Ono will be there as official taster. Uh, the registration fee is $30 and the cause is obviously a good one. Uh, so the Faculty Women's Club has asked us to publicize this and we will send out uh, an alert with these details a little later in the week. The second event uh, is uh, UBC centered and we only became aware of this very recently. The university is mounting on April 7th what they're calling Giving Day. Giving Days have become quite uh, well known, I suppose, in institutional circles in recent times and you may have encountered invitations to participate from elsewhere. This is UBC's first. Uh, it was supposed to launch last year, but was postponed because of COVID. And I think relatively late in the day, the university decided to give it a whirl on April 7th. So that day, April 7th, is a 24-hour festival of giving in which a very large spectrum of people associated with UBC from students, alumni, through staff and faculty to emeriti are invited to uh, help the institution by making a donation. The event is dressed up to some extent. Uh, different faculties have established challenges. Uh, so for example, they may have a special program or interest that they wish to fund. They have recruited someone, usually someone anonymous, to uh, donate a substantial sum, let's say $2,000. And the conditions of that donation being realized are that, let's say, five or ten donations come in during the giving day. No matter what size those donations are, if they're sufficient in number, they will liberate the, the larger donation. So it's intended to be an event to encourage participation. Any donation, no matter how small, is very welcome. Uh, and of course, larger donations will have proportional effect. Uh, the website is givingday.ubc.ca. Uh, it is already open and Donations can be made ahead of time, uh, but 
the real emphasis is on April 7th. Again, there will be information coming around in our alerts about this event, and so we would encourage you to play your part in supporting this occasion. Let me say that mostly the event this year is directed towards uh, support for students in a variety of ways, from supporting athletic teams or uh, music groups through to providing bursaries for particular groups of students. Uh, next year, this is planned to go again. And now that we, the Emeritus College, are part of the conversation, uh, we hope that it may be open to have more explicit opportunities for people to support the work of the Emeritus College. So although we don't figure specifically in the website, uh, we nonetheless would support this and hope that you take the time to look at the variety of good things for which the university is seeking assistance uh, on this giving day. So the third item that I wanted to mention uh, is in a, in a way, I suppose, somewhat related. Those of you who read the newsletter, uh, the Emeritus College newsletter uh, that came out a little earlier this month, uh, will have noticed on pages 17 and 18 that the university has an opportunity to acquire uh, a first folio of Mr. William Shakespeare's plays and poems. Uh, this is a volume from 1623. It is uh, an extremely rare, precious piece of intellectual and uh, literary history. Uh, and there is only one other copy in Canada, as far as I know, at the University of Toronto. The library is trying to raise funds to purchase this volume. Uh, it comes at no small cost. Some estimates put that cost at around $8 million. Uh, there is already a donation for one eighth of that in hand, but the timeline for this is relatively short. Uh, the deadline announced in the newsletter was in fact March 15th, but Christie's, the auction house in New York, which approached UBC about this opportunity, uh, has extended the bid time uh, until I believe April 15th. So uh, this is a campaign that would establish this, many of the, uh, the credentials of UBC in terms of, of literary scholarship. Our colleagues, Herbert Rosengarten and Tony Dawson from the Department of English formally uh, wrote the article that you can find in the newsletter explaining the significance of this first edition folio. And I would ask that you read that article and consider whether you could help in this endeavor to bring the, for, the folio to the University of British Columbia. Uh, the article does make the point that if we are successful in, in, in acquiring this for our library, uh, the plan would be to run uh, a symposium in 2023, the 400th anniversary of the folio's publication, uh, commemorating both the arrival of the folio and the 400th anniversary of that event. So uh, there's much at stake here in the way of an opportunity. Obviously, there's a lot of work to do to try and bring it home but the university and the library have decided that this is not a time to spend public funds in acquiring such items, but that the value of trying to raise those funds privately is worth the effort. So again, uh, I would simply ask you to revisit the newsletter, recognize the extended deadline, and uh, consider how you might be able to help with this. Uh, but with that, let me just conclude this business part of the meeting by saying that uh, things are proceeding smoothly with the Emeritus College. Uh, we have been working at recruiting people to serve on our various committees and our new structure means that we have, uh, I think, a plan and a, a set of protocols in store 
that will really make uh, the work of the college more coherent. And it does also offer an invitation for people to get involved at a variety of levels in different capacities, uh, pursuing their interests, forwarding their passions, and so on. So uh, please support the college by your engagement. That's all that we live for and that's all that we can really do is to encourage the service role that the college provides for our colleagues. So thank you. I'm gonna hand this back now to Elaine for the full suite of the display of artwork and following that, the discussion with three of our gifted artistic colleagues. Thank you, Elaine. Thank you, Graham, and hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Elaine Carty, and I'm delighted to be moderating uh, today's program. Um, my real interest in art really didn't begin until my latter years of teaching, when I began to incorporate visual art, poetry, and fiction into my classes and into my teaching in the midwifery program. And when I saw the enthusiasm and the insights that this brought to the students, it really um, fostered my interest in searching down artist representations, in particular of things like fertility and pregnancy and birth. Well, this interest of mine, of course, necessitated several trips to Florence um, and many other amazing museums around the world, which was a blessing. But we don't have to go around the world to enjoy artistic talent. There's so much creativeness and accomplishment among us. You may recall that one year ago in March, we had scheduled a live art exhibit, which was canceled um, as our COVID lockdown began. That was very disappointing because we were well on our way to having that exhibit ready. So we decided to try and move the exhibit into this uh, virtual world. So we're starting the program today with a repeat of the slideshow that we had in the waiting room. That was a slideshow of various works of visual art by talented UBC professors emeriti. Um, we'll watch the slideshow again together through the shared screen function, which Sandra, our manager, will initiate. If you're having difficulty seeing the slideshow, please go to the chat function and there you'll find a link to a YouTube video of the slideshow. But hopefully that you can see the share screen. Each slide will be on the screen for 15 seconds to give you some time to fully engage with the image. Some of you watched the slideshow before the meeting, so I hope you'll find even more things to engage with as you watch it a second time. Following the slideshow, I'll introduce our three panel members. We have two visual artists and a poet, and they'll give us a glimpse into their artistic life, how it evolved and how it meshed with their academic life and how they manage it now in retirement. And there will be time for questions after the presentation. And I think you all know how to use that um, using the chat function. So I'll ask um, Sandra now to please uh, restart um, the slideshow.
Well, that was <clears throat> that was really wonderful, and uh, I'm sure that many of you watching today could also have contributed work. So we'll be counting on you next year when we try for our live art exhibit. It's now my pleasure to introduce our three panelists, Ann Hilton, Philip Resnick, and Andrew Seal. And I'll say a few words about each of them before their presentation. Ann Hilton will begin our presentations today. I have known Ann for more than 40 years as we were colleagues in the School of Nursing. After graduating from UBC, Anne pursued her graduate work in Toronto and in Texas. She taught nursing students in very highly acute units in the hospital and focused her research on how people cope with uncertainty when living with life-threatening and chronic illness. Anne's interest in painting began when she was a child, but gained momentum in later years. Her paintings have been exhibited widely in the Lower Mainland. And Anne, we look forward to hearing your story. Thank you, thank you very much. And it's thrilling to be here among so many talented uh, colleagues, uh, especially on St. Patrick's Day. But, uh, so I'll um, maybe tell you a little of my story related to my uh, painting. And Sandra, if you'd like to start the uh, slides. Okay. Uh, some of my um, earliest memories, and I don't know if it was kindergarten or grade one or whatever, but I still remember our class going to a cathedral that had a pipe organ. And I was quite enthralled with that. And I guess when we got back uh, to school, we, and uh, so I decided to try this pipe organ. And I just remember lots of yellow stripes. And so, uh, and remember, you know, having people comment on that. And I thought, well, oh, well, you know, I don't know. It's, uh, and then in another year, doing a picture of Christopher Columbus and even using a toothpick to try to um, uh, paint his eyes. Uh, and back then, these particular um, pencils, they were really quite sought after. Oh, come on. Um, you know, you could get 48 of them, and, and I had a paper route, so I ended up, they were 15 cents a piece, and so I, every week I would go in and buy another of the colors, and it was really quite exciting. That, uh, and then our family moved to France and, uh, in 57, next slide please. The um, and uh, when I was 12, my father was in the Air Force, and I, I just remember doing some sketches and things. And so, here's just uh, an example of some of the, the sketches and drawings I did uh, back then. But uh, I guess one of the major highlights for me related to art when I was there, next slide, is um, I took uh, lessons from. A, a French woman artist in oils. Uh, she didn't speak English and I got along with my limited and um, beginning uh, knowledge of, of French. And so every Saturday I would get on my bike with my with my paint kit and she always liked painting flowers. So my mother went to the market every week and got me some flowers. And so I would arrive at her place with these, um, with the paints and we would, uh, we would paint for a couple of hours and that was really neat. And so the next slide shows just a, you know, a couple of the illustrations that, uh, that we did, but um, you know, it's kind of fun. So that was my initiation into oil painting. And I had tried um, uh, pastels, you know, before we had gone to France, but the next slide uh, shows uh, just some of the pastel work that, um, that I did when I was around 15, I guess, and um, uh, quite liking pastels, but I knew it wasn't um, likely going to last. I did try then uh, going into watercolors, and uh, so the, 
Um, you know, just a couple of examples of the watercolor, and I kind of like that medium. Um, the doing oils, you know, you had the linseed oil and the turpentine and the smells and whatever, and watercolor was certainly so much easier in terms of that. And then when I arrived at um, uh, UBC as a faculty member in 1974, that uh, and Alison Rice and I see that she's uh, in our group today. She and I took uh, pottery classes through Aberthau, and then there they have a um, a little barn or a, a shed, and sort of we learned to do some pottery, and that was that was kind of fun. So it's kind of you know various eclectic. So the evening courses were, were really quite good. And uh, then I ended up trying my, my hand at um, stained glass work. And uh, so on the, the left, you can see uh, one of the abstract works that I did. The middle one is actually a, um, a stained glass piece that I have in my living room window. And, and that was fun. I, I did stained glass actually for quite some time without getting too many cuts on my fingers and whatever. Um, when I was in uh, uh, Texas, I actually tried acrylic painting. And um, the, and it's a totally different media. I, um, I tried it. Um, I can't say that uh, it just didn't stick with me as much as um, doing, you know, some of the other, the watercolor and whatever. So when I was working, it was mostly uh, doing my art. It was when I was on vacation. And the next slide uh, is, um, you know, I, I mean, many people didn't didn't know that I did watercolor or art or whatever. But in the year 2000, that was when I was on vacation in the Gulf Islands. And that's when I would have my paints and whatever and bring them out. And uh, the next slide actually shows a, just another example of some of the painting I did, um, you know, on vacation. It just didn't seem like there was much time otherwise during the work week. So I guess the, the major changes in a way came um, when I retired in uh, 2005, that um, um, as I said, you know, a lot of people when I started doing more watercolor and whatever after retirement and they said, huh, you know, we didn't know you, you painted. And so that was kind of, kind of fun. At, uh, so during, uh, you know, my retirement, I've certainly taken a, a lot more uh, courses. And uh, over at the Gibson School of Art, the um, next slide, yes, uh, <clears throat> this was a, a, from a course that I took over there. And uh, I've taken several from them now. But during that particular course, at the end of the, I think it was five days or six days, we were asked to put um, the paintings we had done up on the wall and then we were given three pieces of paper and, and there were about 16 in the class and we were asked to kind of rank which ones we might want to see uh, in a show that the Gibson School of Art had an exhibition after their six or seven workshops and from a selection and um, and this particular one was selected probably because an awful lot of people hadn't ended up finishing a piece during the, the week. But uh, the director of the, the program came up and she said, now, if uh, somebody wanted to buy your piece, what would you want to ask for it? And I just looked at her and I laughed. I thought, you know, I, it never occurred to me that somebody might want to buy a piece of my work. So that was kind of like uh, a knock on the head, I guess, but it was uh, it was kind of fun. So other workshops that I've um, uh, attended um, have been down in the San Juan Islands and uh, well, many, many places. And um, the, the I call them the Lavender Girls on the, the left. That was kind of fun. Um, we were sitting painting plein air in a, a lavender field and these two sisters with their teddy bears came frolicking along and I grabbed my camera and I took picture, picture, picture. And then when I got home, I tried um, 
doing something to to show those uh, so those girls because they were just so sweet and it's uh, so on that particular workshop we went from island to island each day and that was really kind of uh, fun and certainly learned a lot it's, um, and and uh, then I guess um, you know within a fairly short time the uh, owner of in the next slide um, who's from Steveston and she um, owned the kind of the novelty store just on the boardwalk and she asked if I might do a painting of the Steveston boardwalk and so I did that was a commission that was my first commission I think and uh, then she wanted to carry my cards and so I um, um, I ended up um, doing cards and the next slide shows a kind of an example of, of some of the cards and right now I sell them in about 10 or 11 different places in um, in the lower mainland and they do really well and so that's kind of fun but um, there are a lot of different locations that I, I love to paint and uh, if any of you have not been to Finn Slough, that um, it's it's an amazing little community at the foot of Number Four Road in Richmond, and it dates dates back years and years. Uh, and you know, people are are living uh, with almost next to nothing, but uh, it's really quite an artistic. Uh, uh, a place to to go so I'd encourage you because I just I love going there and I don't paint plein air there but I love taking pictures and then coming home and and paint um, one of my paintings that's gotten a lot of attention is my Granville Island fairy um, those little fairies that just pop around and they're so colorful and uh, this particular painting actually was bought by a friend of mine, but the prints and cards that it has sold is really quite amazing. And I just, uh, uh, but I just love, love those little fairies. And, and then back um, in uh, 2010, my brother was visiting my house and I said he could select um, a painting. Next slide, please. And uh, so he ended up selecting a painting and then he said, he said, gee, he says, you know, your nieces and nephew would really love one of your paintings. And at that point, I, you know, I was a little hesitant to be giving uh, a painting to each of them. I think I've since given them at least five or six each. So now they probably want to say, no, 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 don't give any more. But uh, I thought in the meantime that maybe I would do a calendar that reflected some of the paintings that, um, that I had done. And that's actually become quite an interesting tradition because um, the one for 2021 is actually the 12th year that um, I put one together and I, I sell over 110 or 120 of them. So that uh, when people say, oh, no, people don't want calendars, you know, they want their digital and and with cards, they don't want cards. They want it, you know, well, yeah, no, some of those things are coming back and it's really, really true. Next slide. So the connections that I've made uh, have really been uh, quite quite incredible and um, sort of opportunities to show my work and or sell the work as well. And um, Artist in Our Midst, and that's a West Side Vancouver art group um, that uh, I've belonged to for a number of years. And we usually have our roundhouse show in May and then our open studios event. We couldn't have it last year and we won't be able to have it this year, which is too bad. Uh, the South Delta Artist Guild, we have a, a lovely gallery out in Samoasan. So um, it's great and we do workshops and different things out there. And the Federation of Canadian Artists that uh, some of you may be familiar with the gallery that's down on Granville Island that has some incredible uh, work shown. And so it's nice to be a member of that and the Vancouver Art Guild. 
and uh, that we normally have a, a show the first Sunday in November. We couldn't do it um, uh, in 2020. And it used to be down at the Jericho uh, uh, Hill Center. And um, in fact, we've been told that they're not renting that out anymore because I guess that will be torn down at some point. So that's, that's too bad. We're looking at doing online shows and different things like that. But other uh, connections, uh, next slide. Um, we've had, um, had the opportunity of, um, you know, showing with other people. And this is the, the quintessential five. We had an art show out at the South Delta Artist Guild. And, and that was that was really kind of neat. So some of the kind of art that I do, uh, next slide, you know, um, if people want their pets painted that, uh, you know, that's been kind of a fun, uh, a fun thing. And, uh, you know, sort of also challenging because, you know, that I remember doing one and they said, no, the ear needs to be just a, a little bit longer and the eye needs to be this or whatever. And uh, I mean, it's like doing a portrait, you know, you it's it's got to have the right likeness or it's not going to work. But, uh, and the, the next slide shows different kinds of, um, you know, feathers and fur and what do you call the skin of an elephant? Well, maybe it's skin, I guess. Uh, so the, um, and I love painting flowers that uh, lots of opportunity and certainly beautiful flowers around Vancouver to, to paint. And also, um, you know, painting people. And I've, as I say, I've done some portraits and um, that, uh, uh, that um, and I enjoy doing, doing the people and coming up with different kind of renditions of how I could do it. Um, so next slide. Some of our local scenery is um, really uh, amazing to paint. So we got Natobi Gardens and then looking down to Vancouver from um, the Queen Elizabeth Park. And of course our amazing sunsets from uh, Kitts Beach. So, and I have tried by hand at uh, abstract as the next slide shows. Um, and in fact, uh, it's, it's not my, you know, I, I think I'm more of an impressionist or realist or whatever. But this is from a picture I took in Quebec City with the colorful umbrellas that um, overhead of this, uh, this street. And then I thought, well, let me just see what I can do with that. And so that was interesting. And then another abstract was in the next uh, slide. And that was um, on a, on a plein air um, trip to the Banff area. And I thought, well, let me just try doing these uh, reflections and ripples in the water. You know, some people probably wouldn't recognize them for maybe what they are, but uh, that's okay. And, uh, and that's on the trip way that a group of us did to paint um, near Banff. And uh, it was cold. You know, and, and plein air is, is dawn and hard because you're sitting on a stupid little stool and, uh, you know, so your rear end gets really quite sore. And uh, in this case, it was chilly. So sometimes you needed gloves, uh, at least watercolor paint. I mean, they, the, um, the paint didn't freeze or anything like that, but, uh, but it was a, that was a fun trip. It was a fun trip uh, doing different things. And then and another uh, fascinating trip was um, uh, to the Cotswolds in England where it was a you know plein air and so there's a shot of of me sort of looking over at this fascinating grocery store and then trying to um trying to depict that in a way that uh, would would make some sense so the and then the next slide um and this is uh, just on a well i say recent i guess it's november of 2019 when I went to Mexico and uh, some of us were painting there and um, I love the colors, just love the colors of uh, Mexico. So, and then finally, um, the uh, next slide just uh, reiterates some of those um, um, 
groups that uh, I belong to that uh, give a lot of uh, camaraderie and support and, um, you know, connections too. And uh, for you, if any Anybody is interested, my, the next slide just indicates the my website. And um, so feel free to go to it, anhilton.ca, and uh, or connect with me. And I, if you'd like to receive, I do a newsletter, kind of a blog about once a month and uh, related to my painting. And um, if you're interested in um, being on my mailing list, I'd love to... Um, Love to include you, so just email me. And uh, so, thank you. I'm I'm thrilled, as I said, to be here. And um, yeah, yeah. And well, thank you, thank you so much. Um, I uh, I was one of your colleagues who wasn't aware most of the time that you were doing some some painting. I think Allison perhaps had let me know in the latter years. But uh, so I'm just thrilled to see the variety too that you you've been doing. So thank you so much for being willing to share that with us today. Keeps me in trouble. Yeah, well, that's good. <laughs> Okay, we're going to our next um, artist of sorts is Philip Resnick. And Philip has been a member of the Department of Political Science for over 40 years. I think we're going to see Philip's face soon. He received his education in Montreal, Paris, and Toronto many areas of expertise, in particular political economy, comparative nationalism, democratic theory. Philip is widely published, not just in his academic field, but also as a poet. He has seven collections of poems published, the latest called Pandemic Poems, to be published in April. I've had the pleasure of seeing some of those pandemic poems through the through the last few months, and they certainly take us to the heart of the matter. Phil, we look forward to hearing you read some of your work. Uh, thanks, Elaine, and hello, everyone out there. Uh, about a year ago, I published a memoir called Itineraries, and there's one little section of it called The Muse, and in it, I sort of do go into how writing entered my life. So what I'm gonna do in the first uh, five or six minutes is summarize uh, what I write there. And occasionally I may just quote one or two passages from it. And in the second part, what, I, what I'll do is read, uh, I've chosen six poems from this forthcoming collection and Sandra quite nicely has put them up as slides. So the slides will be there to accompany my reading. It'll be a lot easier for folks out there to follow. So uh, poetry entered my life, actually, in my teenage years in Montreal. I went to a high school where my English teacher was Irving Leighton, the well-known Canadian poet. And um, he did manage to instill in a number of the people in the school uh, a love for poetry, and I was one of them. And I began to scribble, nothing of great quality, I must say. I even tried to publish, self-published a little collection at the ripe age of 16, uh, uh, Rambo, I was not, that is for sure, but it showed that it, it something had taken, and I, and I was reading quite widely at that point, you know, some of the great names, like Catullus and uh, Virgil, Dante, Whitman, Rilke, and so on and so forth. But then in the next 10 years, I think it's fair to say poetry receded, I entered McGill, uh, Paris, Toronto, and my interests were much more political science, economics, history, philosophy, and so on and so forth came to UBC, but uh, then in 1969, 70, 71, Greece entered my life. Now the Greece that entered my life was not uh, Leonard Cohn's Idra or the islands that Irving Leighton used to go romping off to. I met my future wife who was Greek, her name was Andromache. We were fellow students in a residence in, at the Cité Universitaire in Paris in 69, 70. And through that Greece became uh, in a certain sense, a second home. Uh, my wife was from uh, Volos, which is a provincial city in, uh, up in Thessaly, in the central part of the country, on the Aegean side, of no great fame, I think, in modernity, but in antiquity, it had another name. It was known as Yolkos, and it was the point of departure of Jason and the Argo in search of the Golden Fleece. And just north of there was Mount Pelion, a very beautiful mountain, a green mountain with chestnut trees and all that. 
And it was known in antiquity and mythology, I should say, as the home of the centaurs. It was also the place to which uh, the gods and the muses came down from Olympus to celebrate the marriage of Peleus and Thetis, the offspring of which was Achilles. So we're getting into some serious <laughs> mythology here, who was raised by the centaur Chiron. Well, we ended up spending both my wife and I, and then the kids when we came along, many a summer in one of the houses in the, one of the villages on top of Mount Pugin, a village called Sakurada. And slowly but surely, and here I, I'm going to read a little passage from the uh, itineraries, um, poetry re-entered my life. I knew enough by way of Greek mythology for this to begin to move me in strange and unpredictable ways. Little by little with each visit, I began to scribble again. Poems inspired by the landscape of Kilian with its stony mule trails, chestnut trees, running water, by the lives of the inhabitants of Sagarada, the feast days with their church bells and their evening revelry, by the tales of fortunes made and lost in faraway Pergamon or Egypt. And then there was the sun rising out of the Aegean far below the mountain in the early morning hours and the seeming presence of the very muses that the ancients had evoked. Writing can be a lonely pursuit, but I felt anything but alone as I surrounded myself in our village house with the poetry of Cavafy or Seferis, two of the modern Greek poets, or Hilderlin, that great admirer of classical Greece, and with my little library of the Greek tragedians, which I could dip into as the spirit moved me. My writing was neither forced nor driven by the instrumental constraints of an academic text or a newspaper deadline. It seemed to come from some untapped inner source, as though what I was about to put onto paper with my pen, this was before computers, had been waiting all along for me to record. And so I began to write again. And in fact, I published three collections in the late 70s and, and the 80s with titles such as Poems of Pelion and The Centaur's Mountain. And it was quite clear that uh, in a certain sense, I had, I had acquired a muse in, in, in on Pelion. Uh, it turned out in the, in the years that followed that that muse fortunately followed me to many other places. We were all, this was, these were the years when it was possible still to travel in like the COVID year. And uh, various places I would go to, I ended up writing as well. Less so in Vancouver, I must say, in those years. Vancouver didn't have the estrangement effect of some of the many other places one got to go to in, in the course of one's academic travels. However, from 2003 on, my wife unfortunately developed a series of chronic illnesses, which made it impossible for her to return to Greece, which meant therefore that I couldn't go gallivanting off either, and more and more became factor caregiver. But, uh, I realized that in some ways, that being the case, I would have to bring my muse back here to Vancouver, which is what I began to do uh, from about 2009 to 10 on, 2010 on. And more and more, I, I was able to do some of my poetry writing here as well. Um, and it led to the publication of a collection in 2015 called Footsteps of the Path, Past which dealt with, among other things, Vancouver was in there, but it also dealt with the sad business of infirmity, which is what my wife was suffering from a series of serious uh, illnesses. And uh, that was also, in a certain sense, I uh, found a certain comfort in being able to at least find in the muse of fashion expressing this. She died, unfortunately, in 2016. Um, and I started to go back to Greece after her death. It was bittersweet, to put it mildly, but, in a strange kind of way, I realized that uh, it really was my second home. In the interim, uh, my younger son had fixed, had fixed up one of the, another house, uh, an old storehouse at the bottom of the mountain, that Mount Pelion, a little cove called the Mukhari, and a lovely little cove which is right on the Aegean with a lovely olive grove behind it. And so, more and more, that has become. Uh, is essentially my writer's retreat. I could think of worse places to go. In fact, the little cove in question figures in the film Mamma Mina, for anyone who might be interested. It's, it's one of the scenes in there is set exactly besides our, below the house. Now, Sandra, I wouldn't mind if you could put up the first slide, the cover slide, because I'm now going to switch to the uh, current period and I'm going to move to the six poems that I want to read. So I'll just wait for Sandra. So uh, I wasn't expecting this. Of course, this past spring and summer, there was no way of going back to Greece. 
But what did develop, to my surprise, honestly, is uh, I discovered I was acquiring a pandemic muse. And I began to write almost from the beginning of the COVID business, uh, end of February. And in the course of the year, the poems were coming very frequently to a point where there is now a collection which will be published shortly. It'll be coming out at the end of April. And what I've done is I basically put a date under each of the poems. And it, it's a sort of poetic version of, I suppose, what Defoe did, did Daniel Defoe back in, in his uh, journal of the plague year, his history of the plague in London, the great plague of 1665, uh, 66. Mine, of course, is, takes the form of poetry. And uh, it's also fair to say I wrote it as I went along. But Defoe wrote his 50 years after the event, it's quite a different story. So let me, I will turn then to the poems I'm going to read. Let me start with the first one. So Sandra, could you perhaps put the first slide up? The next slide, I should say. Very good. No, but yeah. Well, the title should come as no great shock to the, all, all the people in this room, or at least here in Vancouver. Be kind, be calm, be safe. This is in a certain sense, this is my Bonnie Henry poem. Uh, I, things are not looking nearly as rosy at the moment as they were back in April when I wrote it, but still, British Columbia on the whole has done quite well in terms of the pandemic compared to most other places in the country. So I, I think it's still true. British Columbia has not always been a beacon of kindness, of calmness, or of safety. One thinks of how its indigenous peoples were historically dealt with, Asians at the turn of an earlier century, Japanese Canadians during the expulsions of 1942. One remembers the labor disputes, often bloody, providing little quarter for those who threatened the established order. One recalls landslides, mining disasters, avalanches, forest fires, raging rivers, and an often tempestuous sea. Yet in the 2020 pandemic, the province has been something of a standout. Its provincial officials taking science seriously, introducing regulations expeditiously, its population internalizing social distancing, almost a second nature, and altogether flattening the curve more successfully than many others. Uh, the next one, please. Sam. This poem of Muses will actually be appearing uh, in the April issue of the Literary Review of Canada. Uh, and it's inspired by, it was inspired by a line by uh, that great 20th century Russian poet, Anna Akhmatova, where she wrote, and she went through, she lived through the, the, the bitter Stalin years and she, know, she knew of what she wrote in this passage from her poem. Are you the one, she writes, whom Dante heard dictate the lines of the Inferno? So here's my muses. We usually think of them on their ethereal Olympian slopes, bathing in its coolest streams, flying to the side of moonstruck lovers or grief-stricken bards mourning the dearly departed. Yet they are no less at home with pestilence and martial settings, Homer, with a plague decimating the Greek contingent on Ilion's plain. The Mahabharata with its feuding Kaurava and Pandava princes. Shakespeare with his bombastic celebration of Agincourt. The muses are all too human in their stances and just as cruel. Uh, the next one, please. The Deserted Campus. Now this was inspired by a quite famous poem, many of you will probably know it, by Oliver Goldsmith dating from the 18th century called The Deserted Village. And what he was describing was the increasing movement from the villages and the countryside to the city as the Industrial Revolution was just getting going in England. Something which was to be reproduced, of course, in country after country as industrialization was to come in. But this is, the deserted campus, and it came to me as I happened to find myself on campus at the very beginning of September, normally at the beginning of term. The campus where you spent your adult years is strangely silent, malls deserted, buildings largely closed to human contact. The knowledge economy pivot to a brave new world 
has fallen on bleak times, hollowed out in a virtual way, like villages of yore or smokestack towns where factories once had sway. Here and there, a masked passerby, a fitful library clerk advancing a volume over a sterilized tabletop, like some purloined treasure from the deep. Row on row of classroom desks sits empty with darkened overheads, the noisy banter signaling a lecture's end not soon to be repeated. Such is the state of things year one of the pandemic, the alma mater which its denizens held dear, a mothballed amphitheater with a chorus of ghostly refugees from yesteryear. The next one uh, is called The Prophets of Yore. And I was brought up religious, though I lost my faith in my teenage years. I'm probably not the only one to whom that would be true. But I still have to confess a slight soft spot for the prophetic tradition. I think that comes out in this particular story. We miss them, those prophets with robes and deep voices, presaging the doom that clearly awaits us. The foe from afar who will scourge us and purge us of sins we've committed and ruinous behavior that haunt as the natural order dissolves around us. We yearn for the hope that a voice from the desert will lift up our spirits and speak of the hilltops where sunlight is breaking and the cycle of plagues and wanton destruction can finally cease. And we know that their message, though stark, could ring hollow. And the God they bespoke has been silenced forever. Yet we yearn for the comfort of words of atonement, that only those who have wrestled with torment can ever pronounce. Uh, the fifth poem is from November. I wrote a number of poems around the time of the American election and its aftermath, and it, it figures in the poem, but it's more than just about the aftermath of the American election. This one is called A New Credo. In the 19th century, nihilists questioned the underlying premises of the prevailing social order. The 20th century saw ideologies in the saddle, fascism and tooth and claw, communism at its most intransigent, nationalism both moderate and extreme shoring up the middle. Now the 21st century sees a new credo in the ascendant, denialism. Holocaust never happened. Gulags, a dissident insinuation. The great leap forward or the madness of the cultural revolution, an irrelevant aberration. Electoral defeat by any normal measure, figments of one's opponent's imagination. And to cap it off, rising sea levels, melting ice flows, raging cyclones and pandemics relegated to the realm of science fiction. And the final poem, which is also the final poem in the book, and which was written on the final day of 2020, is called Pavan for a year now ending. Pavan is a formal dance, I think dating from the 17th century. And the term memento mori is a year that may not be familiar to everyone. It's from the Latin. It means something which reminds us of our mortality. For example, skulls, which monks and, uh, and scholars would often keep in their rooms just to remind them of, of their mortality. So Pavan for a year now ending. As pestilence emerged from the lower depths where it had long resided, silhouettes rehearsed a macabre dance beneath the memento mori. And we slowly withdrew from the dancing floor to months of forced confinement within the borders of our walls and our restless unhinged minds. But dance we will and dance we must as the clock ticks down the hours, and we hope even those whose faith has lapsed that an annus less horribilis will see off the one that expires. Thank you. Thank you so much, Phil. Um, I always 
fine for me, and I think others have said that poetry evokes often feelings and emotions that you didn't know you had uh, that pop out of those those words. So thank you, thank you so much for that and for um, the publications of poetry that you've done over the years. Then your political science does show up in each of the poems too, I think. But anyway, I'm sure people will have some questions for you too. So thank you very much. Uh, Andrew Seal is our, our last presenter. Um, Andrew was educated in the United Kingdom, but has been a member of the Department of Surgery and an active surgeon for over 40 years. He continues to provide assistance to his surgical colleagues as needed. Over the years, Andrew's been committed to nurturing the arts and humanities in medical students and is well known for his role starting the tradition of the annual spring gala concert and art show in the medical school where students showcase and share their incredible talents. He's been painting all his life and also works in diverse media. Um, I would say even collage, as I recall recently seeing a collage piece for his granddaughter featuring a dinosaur. Andrew, we look forward to hearing about your journey. Well, thank you uh, so much, Elaine, for your introduction. And uh, thank you to uh, previous speakers, Liz and uh, Phil, for your marvelous uh, presentations. Uh, and to everybody who contributed to the slideshow, which I thought was just wonderful. I mean, we have so much talent in our faculty and it was just a, a real treat to see all the work, uh, many done by people I know well. And it's nice to see so many of my, my colleagues and friends actually uh, online today. So I'm gonna share my screen and let's see if this works. We hadn't che checked it later. So let's see if I can get it to work. You'll have to tell me if this is coming up okay. Now, does that, is everybody seeing that okay? Huh? Yes, indeed. Yes, yes that was great. Yeah. Lovely. So here's my first slide. And uh, as you can see, I've put some down the, some of the pointers that Elaine asked me to cover. Um, when your interest started in the arts and how it's evolved and how you have integrated it into your life as an academic and how has it evolved since retirement? And then finally, what do you see yourself doing in the future? So this first slide is actually my last slide, because uh, as far as the future is concerned, it's all about my absolutely beautiful grandchildren that are just the light of my life. And um, one of the, the, the pictures on the left is actually of my son and, and daughter in the studio some years ago, and then my son's children and my daughter's children. So it's a, it's a special slide to start the, the talk with. But... Let's, I want to start with, uh, you know, when did my interest in art begin, began? And it's with my, with my father. He was a, a research scientist, but also an amateur artist and uh, went to night school painting and would come home with his um, works of art and show them to us. And uh, this is one of his, which I have hanging in my, my office here at home. And uh, it, uh, it's just a delight to see every day and reminds me of him and my, my uh, young life in London. Of course, growing up in London, I was exposed to all the greatest artists you, you can hope to see at the Tate and the National or the, uh, and at um, visiting Paris, seeing the wonderful Moulin de la Galette and New York, the, the Guernica. So all, these are all paintings that have, have uh, excited me and interested me over, over many years. But as a, as a 15 year old student, um, now why can't it advance? Let me just see. down here there we are as a 15 year old student i actually uh, won a prize for my painting on the left of the oarsman at chateau by renoir and it was some years many years later i actually saw the original painting at the national museum uh, national art gallery in, in washington and I, I don't think i did too bad a job in fact when i look at them side by side <laughs> i went to medical school in london as you heard and studied at guys and uh, on the right there you can see the, part of the old London Bridge and inside the cupola is John Keats who was a guy's medical student and I think it's so appropriate to be able to show that after Phil's absolutely wonderful poetry. After I graduated I went to sea for a little while as a ship's doctor looking very jaunty 
uh, on the SS Arcadia sailing to do the first Alaskan cruises here, coming out to Vancouver the first time that the crew called the ship 44,000 tons of rust, lust and thrust, which was rather amusing, I think. Um, and uh, after that, I returned to um, London and taught anatomy for two years at Guy's Hospital. With, um, and I show this slide because it's the frontispiece of the great uh, Vesalius uh, Fabrica, in which we have a, an original first edition of 1543 in our library, which this is taken from. And I encourage everybody, they get the chance to go and see this magnificent book in, in our UBC library. Uh, I studied printmaking with Harvey Daniels at the Brighton College of Art for a while. Um, he's a great um, printmaker in, in England, and this is a, my first, one of my first lithographs of Marlene Dietrich I did in 1974. And then in 75, I returned to do a locum on the ship as a ship's doctor, looking much more like the real thing this time. And while I was here, was interviewed uh, and had the opportunity to join our general surgery program here in Vancouver. So my wife and I um, up and left England and immigrated here, and, and the rest is history, as they say. And these are some of my mentors and teachers throughout my training um, taught me so much. The mentorship has always been such an important part of my life. Um, Haile Debas, you see here, in fact, moved to Los Angeles uh, and I joined him in a post fellowship year after I um, received my fellowship. And whilst I was there, I wanted to make sure I was still doing some of my art. And I did this portrait of, of Morton Grossman, which hangs in the library there. He sadly died the year I was there, but he's one of the great uh, scientists of of, um, of our time. I returned to Vancouver in 1981 and started my surgical practice at a place that is familiar to many of you, I have no doubt, the Health Sciences Centre Hospital, as it was called then. just want you to take a look at the logo here, just as we'll come back to the logo in a minute. Um, and some of my colleagues are actually online today, and it's so nice to see you have joined us. But I now had, uh, having given up being a resident and a medical student, I had my life back, if you like, and I could choose what I wanted to do with my time. And I decided to, to enroll at the Emily Carr College of Art, as it was then, in their extension program. And um, every Thursday night for five years, I painted under the uh, direction of Ken Wallace, a wonderful local artist, some of you may know. And so on a Thursday, I would come from the hospital, change out of my scrubs and jump on my bicycle. Um, I put jeans on first, of course. and. Uh, painted for four hours every Thursday night. And I learned so much during that, that four years of in terms of um, painting. Um, I did workshops at, with Gordon Smith, and, who was just a wonderful teacher. His, it was all about the act of painting with him as he put on the title of his book. Tony only was uh, not only a patient of mine at one point, but I became good friends. And one of the great days I remember is spending a day with him painting on Spanish banks, just watching him put his washes down. He was just a, an absolute master, one of the best. In the, in the true tradition, and he just left us far too soon. But I was quite productive now. I, I was able to do a lot of work in which I um, was doing various things, styles, acrylics, watercolors, collage, and so on. Um, and on a trip to New York, I was intrigued and loved the uh, abstract expressionists, which uh, here's a painting of de Kooning, which really intrigued me. And when I came back, I started doing some large abstracts myself. Um, and uh, happily, one of them was actually chosen to be on the cover of the Canadian Medical Association Journal in 1986, which was, which was really rather special. Uh, and if you go to the, the ground floor of the Health Sciences at a hospital, uh, you will find this abstract expressionist um, interpretation of our Health Sciences Centre Hospital logo, which I pointed out to you earlier. I created a studio out of my double garage at home, which I put in lighting, plumbing and heating and so I could work all year round and was quite productive uh, enough that I could actually create a, enough work to have an exhibition in 1988 at the Bushton Mowat Gallery at the time. So with painting, surgery, teaching, family life, life was pretty full. And in 1994, I had the good fortune to be appointed the first Associate Dean of Student Affairs uh, in the Faculty of Medicine, as you heard. And, wanted to continue nurturing and encouraging our students in the arts and initiated the annual Spring Gala concerts. And these are the posters from the last 26 years of the concerts. Uh, I started uh, art shows for our students and faculty and um, alumni, which have been very successful over the years and continue. And as I say, student life, is, students have been very important in my life. The, we have the 
a, a surgical, a painting night with students and my mentor group, then teaching history of medicine up in Prince George and then down here, Gordon Horner and the medical school choir be, before a concert of the gala. And if, at the end of my uh, term as associate dean, I give, gave this uh, uh, bouquet to the uh, office which hangs in the 11th floor of the uh, Diamond Center. I then was able to, to take a year sabbatical, which was just a wonderful year for me in Cambridge, uh, where I chose to study the history of medicine and the history of art, uh, connections, uh, and it was uh, just a wonderful year. In the Cambridge Library, I had found this amazing, um, rare colored version of the frontispiece of the Fabrica that I showed you earlier, just a spectacular piece of, of to look at, um, bringing to life what the uh, teaching of the medical students in Padua in 1543. I also looked for interesting lectures that I could go to. The, the one entitled The Maps of Leonardo da Vinci intrigued me at the Department of History of Art by Martin Clayton, the curator of the Royal College in Windsor. And it was a fascinating lecture. And afterwards I introduced myself and said I was a visiting surgeon from Canada. And he said, oh, well, we have all of da Vinci's anatomical drawings in Windsor. I think you might be interested in seeing them. He very kindly invited me to come to Windsor. Uh, my wife and I went in um, 2000 and spent a morning in the in a sanctum in the, of the castle and the, the Royal Library going through every one of da Vinci's anatomical drawings. It was one of those moments in, that I shall never forget. I came back in Vancouver, had another exhibition at the Third Avenue Gallery, and then in 2003 moved to St. Paul's where I had the last seven years of my career, wonderful seven years with colleagues in uh, at St. Paul's in surgery. And this is my final operation uh, where I did a painting of um, myself and my assistant was my son who was a resident in surgery at the time uh, and he came and assisted me and he's now in practice at St Paul's so it's a special moment and this may be the greatest retirement cake that's been ever been made uh, of um, me doing a, a an inguinal hernia repair and every aspect of that cake was edible and since retirement, I've been in, still in contact and involved with students and, and residents. And here we have a wonderful morning we had for our general surgery program with the residents and faculty and their children painting at the Ems Medical Student Alumni Center. And as you can see up here, I brought my, my father's uh, painting to inspire us all, which it certainly did. Travel for me has been important as I know it is for all of you. Uh, and uh, here are my wife and myself in 2000. In 2013 at Machu Picchu. Uh, I take lots of photographs wherever I go and then bring them back and, and use them as source material for paintings um, in the studio. Uh, these are photographs from uh, Antelope Canyon in Arizona. If those of you who haven't been, it's probably one of the most amazing places to visit. I hope once this is all behind us, the pandemic, we can. I would encourage you to go. And so these pictures I took and then came back to the studio and started interpreting some of the images that I'd seen in that amazing trip on the wall of my studio. Uh, my wife and I are complete Italophiles and we love visiting Italy. There's a, an Umbrian landscape in uh, Italy from a photograph I took and then some, some images from, from scenes from Venice. In 2018, I was intrigued by the um, Olympic Games, the, the Winter Games in Pyeongchang and did a series of, of um, drawings and watercolors of the athletes in the games and the pandemic in the, uh, as you can see here. Now this, uh, the, the uh, two man bobsled at the top here, I'm happy to say that actually image is actually now in the own, owned by the gold medalist himself, Alexander Kopak. He sent me this picture just quite recently. And two years ago, the uh, guard bar on the beach had their 30th anniversary and I painted uh, the late Douglas Campbell as a gift to them. Uh, I knew Douglas, I got to know him quite well when he was here in the, in the 90s uh, <coughs> as part of the company. And here's Christopher and myself and the painting. So when the, the Bard on the Beach is back, I, um, when, when you go and see it, you'll see that on your way into the Douglas Campbell Theatre. But of course things changed. And I think the last part of my talk will really follow on from Phil Philip's poetry in a way. Um, on March the 11th, as you know, we, uh, um, the World Health Organization declared uh, a pandemic and life changed for all of us. 
This is a picture, a photograph I took in Kitts Beach actually a year ago today, before things sort of changed. Um, and then we started to see signs, stay apart, um, do your part. We are all in this together. And uh, of course, Bonnie Henry has been such an important part of our lives for the past year, guiding us through it. And I wanted to do something for the children really to try and sort of help them understand in a way. So I did these rather silly um, drawings and uh, watercolors um, imagining Piglet and Pooh having a FaceTime conversation on their iPhones and Piglet says, why can't I come and visit anymore? Do you still love me? And Pooh says, of course I do. I'm just social distancing for a little while. And Piglet says, can we FaceTime again tomorrow and invite Eeyore to join us? And Pooh says, oh, you always have such good ideas, Piglet. That's why I love you so much. I'll see you tomorrow. And, and as you can see, Peel, they, they call P Eeyore and uh, he's so happy and he thanks him. He says, you are such good friends who take so much care of me. Anyway, that, that was, you know, I, I know that it was enjoyed by a lot of people, a lot of children particularly, to help them understand what was going on. But of course, things got really so, so much worse. And we started to see images on our screens every, every night in the news of ICUs and people on ventilators and the death toll was rising. And it's been, it was just a, a tragedy all year. And of course, it still is. I mean, it's just be, it continues in our lives. And I wanted in the studio to sort of represent in my artwork what was happening in the world. And um, here are a couple of drawings. This is from the, the on the left is the uh, ICU at Turin with those words of Bonnie Henry I put on there, be kind, be calm and be safe as, as Phil had in his poem. And then on the right is the ICU at BGH with the ECMO machine. Uh, uh, and I'm happy to say this painting, this drawing will be hanging in BGH in about a week or two's time. You know, I felt quite isolated with the social distancing and not seeing anybody and I wanted to do something. So I did a series of watercolor um, uh, bouquets to uh, thank the uh, first line, the, the frontline heroes and healthcare heroes of ours and um, gave them to St. Paul's and they were um, auctioned online as part of the, to support their COVID um, uh, campaign. Uh, and uh, the, the center one, at the time at the end, when it's all finished, I have a nice little one minute video of my doing that painting, if anybody would like to see it. In the week of May the 11th was uh, nurse, National Nurses Week. I did this little uh, image to thank our nurses for what they were doing for all of us. I mean, they've really been amazing at the front line and so often the last people to be with patients as they die, as you know. But then on May the 25th, a day we shall affected the world in a way, was the murder of George Floyd online, something we saw in real time. It just chattered us all, I think, and continues to. Um, and I then did a series of drawings in relation to the, the um, demonstrations and the outrage that, was, that followed and with images of, um, from Lafayette Square and uh, Portland and New York and painting Black Lives Matter in New York. And, you know, I just felt that I needed to somehow express what was happening in, in a sort of artistic way that uh, reflected the times we were going through. So these are, it's been a difficult year for all of us. And in fact, we've been very lucky. We've, we've walked every day almost in the Pacific Spirit Park and it's really uh, enriched our lives. It's been a sanctuary and it's just been so wonderful many days to see the changes of the seasons, the light, the colors. Uh, the magic, uh, and it really has sustained us through such difficult times. And I've done some paintings uh, from our uh, visits to the park, and recently I put together a whole series of digital images which I did, made from the from the, the, the photographs. And the last part of the talk is really relates to something that happened on October the twenty second, when I and early in the morning I was listening to the news and I heard that. Um, 546 children separated at the border by the American government uh, had not been reunited with their families and it just took me to the core in a way. I mean I knew this had happened two or three years ago but it suddenly came back um, uh, in the report and as a grandfather and a father it just I thought this is this is something that's so sad and that morning I went out to the uh, the Pacific Spirit Park and uh, in the trails next to the uh, University Hill Primary School, collected 546 leaves, which I brought back to the studio <laughs> and started drawing each leaf. And did so over the next 39 days uh, in the studio. 
uh, during that time, in fact, the number of 546 increased to 666. And so I added those extra leads. Fortunately, I had a roll on the wall that I could just keep going down. And finally, uh, I finished the piece um, on November the 30th, day 39. I'd drawn each, each day, I'd been drawing these leaves on the wall of the studio. And then I put all the leaves themselves together in a, in a, a box, which is now in, this, in our library. The book on the on the chair is separated by um, Jacob Soporov, which uh, I would encourage everybody to read to understand the, the tragedy of the separation of the children. But that really wasn't the end of my leaf story because uh, on uh, December the 11th, we went to an exhibition at the Museum of Anthropology, which I, I, I hope that many of you went to called Shame and Prejudice. It was a remarkable exhibition that uh, left, left a deep impression on me um, and this painting uh, by uh, Kent Monkman of the um, separation of children from the indigenous children to be taken off to the um, to the schools um, away from their families, um, the residential schools. I just found it just so distressing to see, and the text that went with it in the exhibition. I I, I haven't got time to go through that now, but I realised that in fact my drawings of the leaves representing the, the children that had been separated by the American government needed to be, um, was really an incomplete image. And I, I felt that I had to uh, represent the children, uh, the over 150,000 that have uh, separated over seven generations. And I added, uh, I, fortunately I had another air room on the, on the, the uh, paper to add a, a second column beside another 188 leaves to represent the children um, that our government had uh, so cruelly separated uh, from their parents. And so that's really where that, I completed that just a month ago and that brings us up to date in a way. And I'm now back to my first slide, which is my last slide, uh, because what do I see, see myself doing in the future? It's about my grandchildren and about my studio and, and creating work that reflects the times in which we are living. Uh, and if uh, if you'd like to see some of my work, I have a, a, a blog called The Changing Palette, where all my work has been in since March of, of 2013. Um, and I also have work on Instagram as well, if you're interested in following some of it. So that really brings me to the end of the talk. And I just have to st stop sharing my screen and get back to seeing you all again. Oh, there you are. <laughs> sure. Yeah, make sure I'm off mute this time. Andrew, thank you so much. Uh, what a range of work you've done over the years and also very meaningful too. So um, it was a pleasure to see all of those pieces. It's a pleasure for all of you. Now I'm hoping that we'll have some questions on the chat that we can uh, work with. So if anyone feels like they would like to ask a question, please do so. And uh, if not, I'm going to start. I, uh, Phil, I'm going to ask you a question to start about, um, I don't know, like how, how does a poem start? Like, what do you, <laughs> does it work around in your head for, you know, a few months first? Or do you sit down and, you know, when we write an academic paper, where we're usually reporting on a piece of research. It's pretty clear. The topic is pretty clear. But this clearly comes from, you know, your muse. But how, how do you get started and how does it evolve? How long does it take? It's a very good question. I begin this uh, little section of itineraries with that very, why does one write? Where does it come from? And I'm not sure I can quite answer that. Sometimes I'm thinking just of this past year, and, and you know, it's interesting how complimentary I found, uh, complimentary with the E in it. I found Andrew's thing with some of the poems I've written because I mean, clearly a crisis like this, you know, which is clearly has, has really turned our world upside down cannot yeah. but in a very deep way affect us whether it's in the form of painting or, or writing whatever else so sometimes it's literally it could just be a newspaper an article i happen to have read that morning or something a line will come to mind you know and it's, it's suddenly like for example the one i read about the muses Achmatova's very grim view of the muses with dante 
suddenly struck me as not entirely, and I'm, I'm you know, we, we tend to overdo the muses as some very happy and wonderful, but positive things, but uh, there's a lot of very tragic things which muses have also been known to, uh, <laughs> to inspire. And so there's, that's an example. Um, sometimes it's, um, it's just, you know, there's, 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 you know, again, uh, you know, an item, uh, you know, an item that, you know, some, some particularly stark item, Andrew was referring to the children at the border. One morning, I remember reading an article about an Indian labor. This was in early April when uh, the uh, government in India decided that we had to go back home, back to their villages. And there was this poor uh, 48 year old, uh, basically, uh, you know, a peddler, you know, what do you call them? The cart, you know, the people who was just to sell things from the cart. So I had to go back home without a job, without any prospects. And I couldn't help but feel there was all this whining and about the people on this cruise ships who were stuck and this and that and all the rest of it in our wonderful Western world. These were the people who really were going to be paying the high price for this. So that, that would inspire another poem. But uh, it's, it's very hard to tell. And one thing I have learned is if you try to program things that don't work, you can't program. Uh, you really do have to some degree to depend on uh, something which is not purely, which is... Again, muses are just a, an artifice for something else, something which really does, I, in certain sense, comes from here and not just from the cerebral part of the brain. I think that's, the, that's the best you. answer I can give. Oh. Okay. And does it happen quickly? I mean, do you write it quickly? Yeah, I do. The, well, since I'm not into writing know. epic poems, I'm like, you know, Virg Flordon's oh, Yes. In fact, in fact I made this so point a, a few oh, months right. ago. We had a thing about biography. Yes, and it was an so autobiography. Cool. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, we've got uh, Sandra and Bernie Bresler. Can you put your your uh, uh, put yourself on mute? Thank you. Okay, a, a few months ago we had there was a session about biography and autobiography. It had to do with uh, a number of uh, colleagues had written biographies. In my case, it was this autobiography. And someone asked me what's the difference between the two, and I said, ah. In autobiographies, you don't need any footnotes. You don't have to quote anybody. I mean, it's, it's, a, you know, it's a real relief for us folks who've been in the academic game. But it's also the case, uh, the advantage perhaps of poems over even short stories, let alone novels, is they're quick. I mean, you normally, you, you know, you write them on the spot and you can, you know, you write them as well, you can play around, you make, you make changes, but it's something which in a certain sense, is, uh, it's fulfilling in that sense because you, you can see the result almost at once in a way that is less true for the more elaborate versions of the written work and the more elaborate right. versions, I suspect, of the painting and of, of that thing as well. Okay, thank you. And, and Anne, I was uh, thinking about uh, all of the, you, you, know, you talk about painting, painting people and animals and so on and so forth. What, what percentage of your uh, work would you do um, on site as opposed to from a photograph, for example? Like if I wanted you to um, paint me, would you come to my place and do it here? Or would I go to your studio? Or would you take a photo? Would you work from that? How? What do you do most of the time? Most of the time I'm working from photos. And uh, so I would, um, you know, ask you if you've got photos that you particularly liked uh, and uh, work with those. Um, so, um, yeah, particularly if it was a, a portrait or if it was like pets, you know, I've, I have taken my camera to um, take photos of, of pets, but Usually the owner has uh, some photos that they really liked uh, because trying to catch the, the pet doing, you know, the, the right pose <laughs> or whatever uh, isn't usually all that successful. But, you know, I have done that. <laughs> so most of the time it's from photos and combining photos and whatever. Yeah. Is that, I would think, doing pets and people and stuff, is you, you mentioned sometimes it, you don't fulfill the expectation of the, the commissioner, right? I mean, that must be, is, is there a real tension there between sort of your, your wanting to express your artistic, you know, notion that uh, maybe this dog looks kind of angry, actually, and you, and you can't paint that because the owner doesn't want that. Do you find yourself 
dealing with that sort of thing very often. You can usually resolve it. You know, you can make the ear a little longer or the eye or whatever uh, the situation is. So uh, uh, it it has always worked out, uh, you know, in the in the long run. But sometimes they they need a little bit of tweaking. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Andrew, I was thinking about a, a theme that came out clearly from your photo, the photos or the slides you showed was your, your um, experience of being mentored and the number of the amount of mentoring you're clearly doing. And do you find like, do you ever uh, pick out a particular student and work with them in more detail? Like, do you see something at the art show, for example, each year and you say to yourself, ah, this person, you know, I'd really like to work with. Do you work with individual students or is it more with the groups of students? I think what happens is that, you know, you know, like meets life. And I mean, I meet so many students over the years who um, are, uh, you know, just wonderful artists in themselves. And, you know, we just meet and talk and uh, we, um, the, the, the annual art show is, is organized by art students. Uh, and we'll often get together and, talk about the work and talk about their work. And I think it's it's not not so much I seek them out or they seek me out. I think we seek each other out because we have just mutual interests. And I, I think the important thing for me is just to make sure it's being nurtured uh, within the school, within the program, so that students realize that they have these wonderful talents that they do need to be given the opportunity to express themselves. Because one of the problems is, I mean, we're all so busy in what we do that is finding time for our, the things that we love to do in our lives. and and uh, time management is just such a struggle so often. And that's why you know, in retirement, it's rather nice to, <laughs> to not be faced with time management in the same way. Do you know if um, because of your influence, like for example, are students assigned to read, read articles in the Journal of Medical Humanities, for example? Um, I don't know the answer to that really. I just I think again, I think students who are interested will find those articles you know we um we don't have um we have an arts in, in the students themselves have an arts and medicine committee and so like students work together uh, and that's i mean i think that's the way it's always going to be you know you can't force people to to do something i mean there are some people who are athletes they're not interested in the arts and some people are arts they're not interested in being athletic and some are athletes and artists so you know it's uh, i don't think um i don't think that there's a way that we can direct students to do, to uh, to investigate things that, that they're not really interested in. If it's uh, if if something seems to be fair to do that, although we can point them in the right direction. Yeah, I'm remembering this study done at the Yale School of Medicine, where they put one group of students in the art gallery, you know, with the um, the, the the curator who then had them uh, study portrait faces and bodies, you know, over the term, and that group of students scored significantly higher on their uh, physical examination ex physical exam tests than the students who hadn't been in the art gallery. So oh, that's just an example of how I think not making them an artist, but showing how the influence of paying attention to poetry and art and fiction and those kinds of things can influence their practice, in fact. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, we've been very lucky in the Faculty of Medicine. You know, Caroline Cornier has, over many years, we have a program for the students, the Heartfelt Images, which has just been remarkable. And uh, they, 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 each year, they, the students have been, um, had a competition to create images of the heart, um, which are then uh, shown each year and over the years that she's been doing it they're just spectacular they're just wonderful images that they've been created by the students they never they never fail to amaze me yes there is a website for that isn't there there is a teaching medicine teachingmedicine.com teaching. is, is the okay. site where you can see the student galleries in in medicine and in dentistry the dental students i think they have some as well as the 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 galleries that relate to the the white coat warm art that is part of the CME, which um, is a, which is an annual contribution of of, um, of works of art, and there's also one that she created um, for people to to um, submit to in relation to COVID um, to uh, ex show their work that relates to uh, I forget hope hope and um, 
I hope and gratitude, I think it's called, but it's all on the web. It's all on the teaching doc, teachingmedicine.com website. And it's really, it really is worth visiting and, and exploring some of those various galleries. Um, so I don't have any questions, but I have so many comments saying wonderful session, amazing talent. Thank you for doing this. One person did say to you, Anne, um, you did not show one of my favorite paintings done by you, Jelly Bean Row Houses in Newfoundland. Is that not one of your favorites? So that was a question to you. Oh, yeah. uh, is that one of your favorites? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, yes, uh, but you know what? There's a lot of favorites, but that was fun to, uh, to do that one for sure. <laughs> Well, I think we're at near at the end of our time now. So um, uh, I recall, Andrew, in your, the painting you showed that your father did, that's in your office, there was an umbrella. So you'll be pleased to know that the uh, Emeritus College always gives as a gift to its speakers a UBC Emeritus College umbrella. And uh, it seems that we're going to have rain for the foreseeable future uh, as I look at the forecast. So I look forward to connecting to you in the next little while and gifting you an umbrella from the college. Do you so have, thank you do very you, much. Do you have a, do you have a minute to, to if, you, if people would like to see the the watercolor painting because it's uh, it's it's quite fun to look at how it's created. Yes, I think we do. Okay, how long is it, Andrew? One minute. Oh, perfect. Okay. One minute. Let me see if I can get it up. And I think you might enjoy seeing it, actually. Um, and um, Sandra is going to make a few announcements at the end. There we are. That's just wonderful. thought it might be quite fun to see that. That's uh, wonderful. Oh my, I wish my brain could direct my hands to do that. Wow, that's fantastic. That was fun to see, really. Thank you very much. 